Okay, so have you ever, like, really tried to picture something so small that it makes an atom look like, I don't know, a giant inflatable bouncy house? I, uh, I can't say that I have. We're talking about those teeny tiny particles. Yeah. Kind of stuff that physicists love to rack their brains about, you mm -hmm. know. The stuff that actually makes up everything. <laughs> Us, the trees, that cup of coffee. It's a whole different world down there, that's for sure. A realm where our everyday intuition about how things work it kind of, well, it goes out the window. Tell me about it. And when those tiny bits of reality, those particles, when they collide, well, our physicists have been trying to map that out for ages, right? They use these things called Feynman diagrams. You know, those squiggly line drawings you might have seen in like yeah. science articles and stuff? Ah, yes. The physicist's trusty doodle pad, those Feynman diagrams. <laughs> Revolutionary when they first came out, they were. But, oh boy, they can get so incredibly complex, especially when you start dealing with more than a handful of particles. Right. Like trying to, what, untangle a massive, not made of yeah. energy probabilities? I don't even know. Exactly. Okay, I'm already getting a headache just thinking about it. So there had to be a better way, right? Yeah. Some kind of shortcut for these physics wizards. Enter the amplitohedron. Did I even say that right? You got it. The amplitohedron. Imagine, instead of those messy diagrams, we have this, well, picture, a beautiful multifaceted jewel. Okay, I'm with you so far. Now, stick with me here, because this jewel, it exists in higher dimensions. I know, I know, it's a lot to wrap your head around. But the beauty of it is this. The likelihood of a specific particle interaction, any interaction you can think of, is directly encoded in the shape of this jewel, in this amplitudehedron. Okay, hold on a second. I'm pretty good with shapes, generally speaking. But higher dimensions, how does a shape, even a fancy jewel shape, tell you anything about what those tiny particles are actually doing? It's like, are they checking in with the amplitohedron before they collide or something? Think of it this way. Imagine you're trying to figure out the area of a simple rectangle. But instead of just multiplying the length and width, you decide to count every single tiny square within its borders one by one. That's kind of what physicists were doing with Feynman diagrams, just in a much more complicated way. Tedious, to say the least, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely not my idea of a fun afternoon. Exactly. But with the amplitohedron, it's like discovering that elegant formula. Length times width, boom, there's your area. The shape itself holds the answer, you see. In this case, the answer to the probability of different particle interactions. Okay, I have to admit, that's pretty darn cool. But I have to ask, does this amplitohedron thing, does it work for any particle collision? Like, what about the stuff that makes up, you know, us? That's the catch. See, the early amplitohedron models, they only really worked for these theoretical particles that have a property called, get this, supersymmetry. Supersymmetry. <laughs> Sounds a bit like something out of a comic book. A little bit, yeah. It's a bit like those, you know, perfectly symmetrical snowflakes you see in pictures, stunning, but not something you usually find out in nature. Those perfect models, they don't always translate to the messier reality of our universe. Okay, so how do we get from those perfectly symmetrical theoretical particles to the real world particles, the ones that make up, well, everything we see and touch. Do we need a whole new shape, a new amplitohedron 2.0? Now that's where things get even more interesting. Instead of a completely new shape, think of it more as an evolution, a move from those solid shapes, those jewels, to something more fluid and, well, elegant in a different way. We're talking about surfaceology. Surfaceology. I'm sorry, but that just sounds like something I should be studying in art class, not theoretical physics. Maybe we should workshop the name. But I promise you, it's just as mind-bending and groundbreaking as it sounds. So instead of those solid shapes, imagine surfaces, like hills and valleys, but with curves, you see. And these curves represent all the different ways those particles can interact. So instead of a jewel, we've got, like, a mountain range. And the shape of the mountains tells us about particle physics. You're getting it. And here's the truly amazing part. Just one of these curves on this surface can replace a whole jumbled mess of those Feynman diagrams we talked about earlier. It's like taking a whole textbook full of complex equations and compressing it into a single elegant line. Okay, you've officially got my attention. Yeah. But how does this surfaceology thing actually work in practice? I mean, can it tell us something new about the universe that all those Feynman diagrams couldn't? That's the exciting part. It turns out, surfaceology isn't limited to those theoretical, you know, super particles. It's showing real promise for understanding more realistic particles, like the kind you find in the nucleus of an atom. We're talking about the forces that hold the very building blocks of matter together. Now, that's what I'm talking about. This isn't just some theoretical exercise. It's giving us real 
tangible insights into the world around it. Oh, absolutely. But I have a feeling this is just the tip of the iceberg, isn't it? What else is surface algae uncovering? Well, remember how we talked about those hidden connections, those elegant shortcuts revealed by the amplitohedron? It turns out surface algae might be doing something very similar, but on an even grander scale. We're talking about connections between particles that, on the surface, seem to have absolutely nothing to do with each other. Ooh, now this is where it gets really interesting. Give me an example. What kind of particles are we talking about here? Okay, so um, let's talk about these things called pions, right? Pions. They're like these, you can think of them as tiny messengers, these little things that help hold the nucleus of an atom together. They're involved in this thing, the strong force. Remember that? One of the fundamental forces of nature. Okay, yeah. Vaguely. It's all coming back to me now from uh, physics class years ago. <laughs> strong force holds the atom together. Right, so pion, strong force, got it. Right. So surfaceology, it's revealed this, well, it turns out that these pions, these real-world particles, they share a very strange similarity with certain theoretical particles, the kind we thought only existed in those perfect supersymmetric models. Hold on, hold on. Back up a second. You're telling me that those those perfect snowflake particles we talked about, the theoretical ones, those have some kind of connection to these real-world pions. But how... How is that even possible? Well, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? It's like finding, I don't know, like the same secret symbol engraved on both, say, a child's drawing of a unicorn and an ancient stone tablet. The connection is there. It's undeniable. But we're still trying to figure out what it all means. OK, that's just that's mind blowing. It's like it's like the universe has this hidden code, this underlying language and surfaceology. It's like we finally stumble onto the Rosetta Stone or something. Precisely. And it gets even, well, you might say it gets even wilder because surfaceology isn't just revealing these, well, these crazy connections between different types of particles. It's hinting at a link to something even bigger, something much grander. We're talking about string theory. String theory. Wait, isn't that the one where everything in the universe, it's all made of these tiny vibrating strings? Like the whole universe is a giant, I don't know, a giant guitar or something. You got it. That's the one. String theory. One of those, what do they call them? Those grand unifying theories. The kind that get physicists all, well, excited to say the least. It attempts to explain everything, all the forces of nature, even gravity, as different vibrations of these tiny, tiny strings. Okay, I think I'm following so far. So we've got surface theology, which uses these like shapes and surfaces to understand particles, right? Yeah. And then we have string theory, where everything's made of these tiny little strings. But how do those two, how do they even fit together? It's like apples and, I don't know, rocket ships. Well, that, my friend, is the question that has every physicist on the planet scratching their heads and, well, maybe losing a little sleep too. But remember how we talked about the amplitohedron, how it simplified all those calculations by, in a way, encoding information about particle interactions in its shape? Well, it turns out that surfaceology might be doing something very similar, but for gravity. Wait, hold on. Did you just say gravity? You mean that force that keeps my feet planted firmly on the ground, that keeps the Earth orbiting the sun? Right. That gravity? The one and only. Now, here's where things get a little, well, we're going to dive into the deep end of the pool here. You see, in surfaceology, we don't actually see curves that directly represent those, what are they called? Those gravitons. Gravitons. Yeah, those theoretical particles that are supposed to carry the force of gravity. They're like the, the celebrities of the particle world, always rumored about, but never actually seen. Okay, so no curvy lines for gravitons. So then where, where do they fit into all of this? How does surfaceology even touch gravity? if we can't see these gravitons. This is where it gets really, well, really interesting. Because sometimes when we use surfaceology to try and calculate these particle interactions, these really complex interactions, we encounter these, well, we call them phantom curves. Phantom curves, okay, now that just sounds spooky, like, like those phantom limbs that, you know, amputees sometimes feel. I suppose there are some, well, yeah, I can see the similarity. But these phantom curves, as strange as they seem, they may be telling us something really profound about how gravity actually operates at the quantum level in that realm where things get really, really weird. Okay, now I'm officially lost. Yeah. How can a curve, even a phantom curve, that doesn't even affect the final calculations, how can that tell us anything about gravity? It's right. like it's like saying, I don't know, like saying that the ghost of a butterfly can cause a hurricane. Doesn't really make sense. Remember how we talked about how surfaceology is all about simplification, about finding those hidden connections, those shortcuts that, well, that seem almost too elegant to be true. Well, these phantom curves, as strange as they may seem, they might be a clue that gravity, 
even though we can't directly represent it with those elegant curves on our surfaces, that gravity is still woven into the very fabric of this geometric framework. So even though we don't see gravitons, you know, directly in surfaceology, their presence, or at least their influence, it's still there, like it's hidden in these phantom curves. That's the idea. It's like, imagine trying to understand the flow of water in a river. Right. You might not see the rocks on the riverbed, not directly, but you can infer their presence. You can see their influence by the way the water moves around them. It's like that. OK. Yeah, I, I get the analogy. So what you're saying is we're not just talking about understanding these teeny tiny particles anymore. We're talking about like cracking the code of gravity itself. No big deal. Right. It's a possibility, a very real possibility that has a lot of physicists, well, both excited and a little terrified at the same time. You see, gravity, it's always been the odd one out in our attempts to try to unify all the fundamental forces of nature. It's like gravity just, you know, dances to its own tune. It's like, hey, I'm gravity. I do what I want. What? Totally different from those other forces, right? Exactly. And it's that that disconnect, that fundamental difference that's made quantum gravity, you know, the holy grail of modern physics, so incredibly elusive. But surfaceology, with these hints of phantom curves, these hidden connections we've been talking about, well, might just be giving us our first real glimpse into how gra gravity actually operates at the quantum level. It's like peeking behind the curtain, you might say. So are you saying we're on the verge of finally unifying gravity with the other forces? Are we talking like theory of everything territory here? Well, let's just say we might be looking at the very early chapters, the rough draft, maybe, of a brand new physics textbook. Imagine that, a single elegant framework that can explain the behavior of everything in the universe, from the tiniest, most minuscule subatomic particle to those massive structures we see out in the cosmos. Everything. Okay, now I really understand why people dedicate their entire lives to this stuff. It really is like the ultimate puzzle. And it oh. seems like we might actually be, you know, finding some of those missing pieces. But even if surfaceology isn't the final answer, the be all and end all, it still feels like a huge step forward, a monumental leap for physics kind. Absolutely. It's like, well, imagine we've been trying to solve this incredibly complex jigsaw puzzle, right? But we've only been looking at the pieces from one angle, one very limited perspective. Surfaceology, it's like we can finally turn the puzzle, see those hidden patterns, those connections we were missing before. We can start to put the pieces together in ways we never, well, we never could have imagined before. It's like we're breaking free from those old, those limited ways of thinking about the universe, you know? We're ditching those Newtonian straight lines, those rigid structures. Things are getting curvy. Precisely. We're starting to see the universe not as this giant, you know, clockwork mechanism, but as this incredibly intricate, interconnected web of relationships, a place where, well, where geometry itself might hold the key to unlocking the deepest secrets of reality. It really makes you wonder, though, about the limits of all of this. Hmm. Can surfaceology really explain everything about the universe? I mean, are there things... Are there phenomena that it just can't handle? Well, that's the beauty of science, isn't it? There's always more to discover, always more questions to ask. As incredible and as promising as surfaceology seems, it does, of course, have its limitations. It's incredibly good at describing what we call, in physics terms, perturbative processes. Those are those nice, smooth, well-behaved interactions where, you know, things don't get too crazy or out of control. So we're talking about those smooth, elegant curves on our surfaces. Those work really well for a lot of particle interactions, right? But what about the bigger events, the really dramatic stuff, like, I don't know, cosmic explosions and things like that? Exactly. Black holes, the Big Bang. These events, they involve such extreme energies, such intense gravitational fields. It's like trying to, well, it's like trying to map a tsunami just by looking at the ripples in a teacup. It's just not going to give you the full picture. Mm -hmm. We need a more complete picture, what we call a non-perturbative description, to truly, fully understand those kinds of phenomena. So what you're saying is, Surfaceology, it might be this amazing stepping stone, a crucial piece of the puzzle, but it's not the whole picture. There's still so much more out there waiting to be discovered. Precisely. Think about how long Newtonian physics served us well. You know, it explained so much about the world around us. But then, then along came Einstein, relativity, quantum mechanics. We expanded our understanding. We ventured further into the unknown. Surfaceology could very well be a part of that ongoing evolution, pushing us towards an even deeper, more complete, more mind-blowing understanding of the universe and everything in it. This entire deep dive has been incredible, truly. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing to me how much progress physicists are making. And it's really amazing how these complex, sometimes very abstract ideas 
how they really can change how we see the world around us, mm -hmm. how we see ourselves even. It's a testament to, well, to the power of human curiosity, don't you think? Our relentless desire to understand this universe we find ourselves in, to understand our place in it all, and who knows what other wonders, what other incredible discoveries await us out there as we, as a species, continue to explore, to question, to push the boundaries of what we think we know. It's truly exciting. It really is. And on that note, to our listeners, Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey into the world of surface geology, quantum physics, and the quest to understand the universe. And remember, the next time you gaze up at the night sky, or maybe you're just contemplating the intricate workings of, I don't know, a flower, just remember those hidden connections, those elegant curves, those phantom forces that might just be underlying the very fabric of reality. You might be surprised at what you start to see. Until next time.